What up crew, today I'm gonna to share with you five things that I've 3D printed on my home machine that really helped me in tight situations. Let's check it out. First of all, let's talk about three different types of 3D printing. Now, this oven-like beast is an SLS machine which stands for Selective Laser Sintering. It spreads a layer of very fine nylon powder, heats up the chamber to two degrees below melting point, and then uses a laser to melt certain parts of the surface area. Then another thin layer of nylon powder is added on top of the previous layer and the laser centers the selective area. What this means is the powder acts as support material and fills in all the empty spaces of the design part. This whole process takes about 24 hours for each print, so we want to fill up the build area with as much stuff as we can make. And because of the powder, it doesn't matter which way we orient the pieces. After things have cooled down, we're left with a very large block of nylon powder that we have to sift through to find all of our pieces inside. You're limited by size of the part because if it can't fit in the rectangle area, then you're gonna have to cut it up into different printing pieces. Now these are not your typical printers you would see because of the price tag, about a half a million bucks, and the overall maintenance team required to operate one of these bad boys. So they're used in a company that is a 3D printing bureau someone like Digits to Widgets. Now the price tag of a part around the size of a shoebox is about $5,000. So this is usually one of the final steps of prototyping before manufacturing. Because we brush away all of the support material and each piece was created with laser precision, we're able to make very small parts with high detail. And because it's nylon, it's very strong yet flexible, depending on how thick each part is designed to be. This example shows the varying degrees of thickness the laser can achieve. It's also important to note that this entire piece was printed at the same time, because as long as there's a thinness of nylon powder to be blown away, the gap will leave enough area for the parts to move. It only prints in white nylon powder, but the parts can be dyed different colors after the print is complete. The next type of printing is stereolithography, or SLA, which is a resin bath that is cured by a light. The technical term is photopolymerization, but it's basically the Hollywood version of how the Terminator T-1000 liquid metal guy was made. Again, the light is hardening specific points in the resin liquid and then printing the next layer. This technology has come down in price and is around $2,000 for a machine. These are great for very high detail and the translucent resin can give a wonderful look to the piece. They're limited by a much smaller build area around the size of my lotion bottle holder. We'll get to that in just a second. And although they usually print upside down, they may still require support branches to keep the part holding together during printing. Now onto our actual home machines. When people talk about 3D printing, they're usually referring to Fuse Deposition Modeling, or FDM machines. These are basically hot glue guns moving around on an XYZ axis with the precision of stepper motors. There's a wide variety of materials that can be printed, but imagine fishing line being heated around 200 degrees Celsius and then melting onto the previous layer. Different types of materials are PLA, which is basically cornstarch, ABS, like Legos, PETG, Example would be a plastic coat bottle. Nylon, flexible filaments, mixed filaments like blended metals or woods, all the way to clay and of course chocolate. Now unlike SLS printers and all of its glorious nylon pow pow, the printing plastic needs to rest on the layer before it. Otherwise it's just going to fall off into the air. Sometimes this can be used for a creative touch, like making pine needles on a tree branch but usually we're trying to avoid this because it can quickly end up becoming a messy bird's nest. Anything beyond 60 degrees is gonna fall off because there isn't enough area underneath, so that's why we use the dreaded sacrificial support material. The scaffolding is printed alongside the main layer, but when it comes time to remove it, there's no clean way about it. I try to avoid support at all costs because it never looks good during cleaning, takes a lot of tedious work, and can sometimes break your part if it's delicate. But sometimes you don't have a choice, like certain sections on the WorkbenchCon logo I made. No matter which way I oriented this, I would have to move it around and there's always gonna be something that's 90 degrees and the print would fail. Just remember that clean shop is a happy shop. Now there's a wide variety of printer sizes ranging from small desktop areas, like a classic Ultimaker in the $2,000 market, 
to building really tall pieces enclosed in black boxes. Clever girl. This MakerBot is around $5,000, or you can go really big and drop 50,000 on a Titanic machine. This version can print a build area of a cubed meter, but when it goes wrong, it's as deadly as an iceberg, except it has a heated platform and Jack and Rose can both fit on the build area. Some printers have dual nozzles for multiple colors or materials, but let's get back to actually making stuff. First up is this lotion jar holder. Now, it may look stupid and big and bulky, but you know how they make ketchup and honey jar bottles to be upside down nowadays? Well, Nivea, or Nivea, I don't know how to say it, they have made the cap of their jar very nice and curved and it looks very sleek and new age, but it doesn't go upside down and lay flat. So I decided to get a couple extra squeezes out of this. Ugh. So anyway, I designed and printed this over-engineered block to perfectly fit the shape of this bottle. And it kind of grabs your attention. Let me show you how I did this in Fusion 360. I'm first taking a picture of the bottle to scale and making it a canvas so I can sketch out the shape of the top. Once I have the 3D form of the bottle, I can then put it inside a rectangle and remove the shape I created. Because I want to avoid printing with supports, I'm not making anything overhang by 45 degrees. It always looks nice with fillets or chamfers along the borders, and some of these triangles cutting through the piece give it some variety. Then it's off to printing, which took about 8 hours, and now I got gravity working for me. So who says 3D printing doesn't save you any money? Other than I had to spend time designing this and the cost of the materials and the price of the printer. At least I don't get the hose again. On to the next subject, which is plumbing. Next up is this sink bolt tightener. But before we go into that, we need to talk about infill and walls. And no, I'm not talking about those kind of walls. This is not a political channel. Instead, we're talking about shells and thicknesses on your 3D prints. Okay, so this is an infill percentage model. It shows how much you can print on the inside of an object. We rarely print with 100% infill. One, because it takes too long and it's a waste of time. And also it's a waste of material. Um, if you're gonna make something where you thread in screws and you need to keep those threads really tight, then we can do it with 100%, but you really can't tell the difference between 100 and even 60%. We hang really in the zero to 20% range. Um, zero, obviously not giving you any inside thickness, and 20% giving you a lot of uh, strength without having to do any of this overkill. Um, if you want to make your parts stronger, you obviously put more walls or shells around the outside of the print, and you can actually lessen the infill percentage because of this. Okay, now that's as clear as mud. I'm going to explain what this is. So I was installing a new faucet in my kitchen sink, and underneath the sink is a bolt which holds down the entire tap in place. Now if the sink and the pipes aren't installed yet, then you can just get back there and tighten it and make sure that it's not going to go anywhere. But I had everything installed and I was just trying to swap out the faucet, and there's this bolt back there that I just couldn't get at. It was too close to the wall and my pliers wouldn't even go around it. So I designed and printed these tubes which basically go up underneath and can tighten down on that nut and make sure that the faucet is not gonna go anywhere. Because I really wanted to make sure that they would clamp down really hard, I printed with 25% infill and that's plenty. It actually worked the first time really well and I printed a whole series of these just for different options for nuts and bolts later on down the line, but I haven't had to go back and tighten this up yet and it's been a year, so job well done. 
For this next print, let's go into the past and talk about this collaboration that I did with my friend Sebastian. Now this was almost a year ago and I didn't know about my lotion trick, so my skin may not look as good, but you be the judge. He wrote me and asked if I would be interested in helping him 3D print this cone idea that he had. So I had him send the file over and we made a few modifications. I've been requested by a lot of people to actually show the entire printing process and maybe I take it for granted because I see it every day, but here it is in sped up montage form for your viewing pleasure. <laughs> Okay, let's skip forward a bit. And you get the idea. With the 10% infill and the three shells, it turned out really strong and hopefully will last for the entire project. PLA is some of the easiest materials to use and there's the benefit of it being baby and food safe. After long exposures to UV radiation, it's supposed to break down, but I've had prints in my yard for years and although they may become brittle and fade due to sunlight, they've held up really well. You can see the infill diamond pattern from this light, and it's something to think about if you wanted to accent different lampshade designs. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but YouTube just released a new app to us beta people for YouTube teleportation. So we'll try this new app and see if it works. On to you, Sebastian. He'll have a video showing how he used the concrete mold form on his channel, so be sure to check that out. Next up are clamp champs. Not only are these really handy, but they're actually really strong depending, again, on that infill percentage that we talked about earlier. What I like about these are that the 3D threads actually hold up and they're actually pretty strong. Plus, you can customize, obviously, the size and shape to whatever kind of clamp you want, and it's a pretty good fix for, like, a tight situation. They're obviously not gonna replace, like, a metal clamp, but, this one's held up for a year, and it's done pretty good. Last up are items that could be disposable, or they're very cheap, so you don't even want to 3D print them in the first place. But I decided to just be experimental and see what happened. I was retiling a part of a bathroom, and the trowel I decided to 3D print. It worked, um, but... I wouldn't recommend it just because it's a couple of bucks for the tool. However, if you wanna see what your printer can do and you have some filament and you wanna just learn how to design, um, this is a good start. So yeah, some things you don't need to 3D print and it's probably cheaper if you just go out and buy the actual item. Like the spacers for the tiles, I was gonna 3D print those little T's, but you don't need to, it's gonna be a waste of time and they make those for like two bucks for a bag of a hundred. Um, but it's fun to just experiment with design types and playing around in CAD to see how things could be made differently. So yeah, experimenting with this kind of thinking and even making helps you come up with the one idea that actually is useful. That's the perfect thing that you needed to fix. If you wanna download any of these files for free, they're on my Thingiverse page. Print that subscribe button, 
infill that like notification, and let's leave out with a quote. You're still hanging around? All right, well, I'll show you two more honorable mentions that are really cool prints, just because I like you. First is this little piece to attach my light switch cover to securely fit onto the wall. This is the part I was talking about when describing adding a lot of infill for tapping screw threads. And of course we gotta get ready for GOT. Living in London means there's nothing square, so having door stops are essential. And why not represent a small time starving author and my previous employer, a guy named George Er Martin. All right, now go print something. And the tile trowel, boy, say that three times. 